Okay, so today we have uh, Ilya Rasenstein uh, from Microsoft Research. Uh, Ilya is a PhD at MIT, um, graduated in 2017, and uh, done a lot of excellent work on nearest neighbor. Uh, today he'll talk about space, space partitions and optimal transport beyond metric data. Oh, sorry, awesome. Good morning. Today I will talk about space partitions and optimal transport beyond metric embeddings. And uh, basically this is like summary of my talk. Um, so I will talk about two papers which are not super related, except perhaps at the superficial level, which I will explain. And one of these papers, uh, so the only thing that unifies them is that these are like very recent work. And so both of them are joined with Yitia Dong from Microsoft, Peppering from MIT, and Tal Warner, uh, also from MIT. Uh, so basically this is the summary of uh, the first result, so basically I'm going to tell you how to obtain uh, space partitions of uh, d-dimensional space, which are in a certain sense nearest neighbor friendly. Again, I will give you a like, precise definition later in the talk. And uh, basically, the, this algorithm is uh, based on balanced uh, graph partitioning followed by uh, supervised learning. And so this work, basically, uh, it's not really a theory work. I will not show you any proofs, and I don't know any proofs. But it's heavily based on some uh, theoretical work that we have done before, and I will explain the connection. And the second result is a uh, new algorithm uh, for the earth moore distance, uh, also known as Wetterstein 1 distance, uh, and it is based on tree approximation. Uh, so in the title of my talk, there is something uh, which is like beyond metric embeddings, and so I will explain for each of these results in what sense this is like beyond metric embeddings. Okay, great. Uh, so let me start with the first result, and uh, I will give you like broad introduction to the problem. Uh, okay, so before uh, <coughs> before explaining the first result, I'll spend one slide on uh, how do we measure distances. So basically, uh, there are many ways to measure the distances, and there is a whole hierarchy of definitions, and let me introduce them so that we're all on the same page for duration of the story. Uh, basically, the most general definition that mathematically makes sense is that it's that of a metric space where you have some abstract set and some function from, uh, which is essentially distance between uh, elements of this set that satisfies a few natural axioms. And this is the most general definition of distance that mathematically makes sense. And uh, uh, there are many examples of metric spaces. One uh, example is distances in graphs which is essentially like the metric space without loss of generality because any metric space can be realized as a, as a graph in an obvious way. Uh, another example is like edit distance. Uh, it's number of insertions, deletions, and replacements that you need to make to transform one thing to the other. And the third example is like hyperbolic space. I'm not going to define what exactly it is. I'll just say that like geodesics in this space are uh, lines and circles. Okay, so then the second slightly stronger definition is that of a norm space. Uh, so what is a norm space? Norm space, uh, it's a metric space that is consistent with linear structure on RD. Uh, so more formally, you have uh, some vector space and you have some function that measures how large your vector is. And again, it satisfies few natural uh, definitions. Uh, most no notably, it's like sub-additive on the addition of the vectors. And any norm gives a metric. So basically, if you consider norm on difference of two vectors, this is metric. It's easy to check. And uh, there is a one-to-one -one correspondence between norms on RD and some telesymmetric convex bodies. This is also like fairly standard thing. Uh, basically, any convex body can be considered as like unit ball of your norm space, and this gives a norm. And vice versa, if you have a norm, you can, uh, if you have a con uh, yeah. basically it's a one-to-one -one correspondence. So then, uh, the next, Definition is symmetric norm space. It's a norm <coughs> space which is symmetric under permutations uh, and sign flips, uh, for example, P norms. And finally, the norm space that we like the most, and this is the nicest, it's Euclidean space, uh, where it's pretty much like square root of sum of squares, and it has all kinds of nice properties. Most notably, why we like uh, Euclidean spaces and why they work great for us is because they have like some notion of rotation, which other spaces do not have. Okay, this was mostly a detour, but like we don't really need this slide that much. I just wanted to show it because I think it's kind of like nice to uh, 
uh, systematize these things. Um, so my first result is talking about uh, nearest neighbor search, uh, and uh, I have come already here three years ago and gave talk about nearest neighbors. Uh, but let me nevertheless repeat all these definitions again, just that so that we are all on the same page again. Uh, <coughs> basically, the setup is that we have some metric space and we have a bunch of points in it, which is a data set, and we have some distance scale r, uh, and we would like to build some data structure uh, that takes a query point and returns any data point within some distance r. Uh, and parameters that we care about are space that the data structure occupies and time it takes to answer a query. And there is a natural trade off between the two. Uh, and an important special case is when uh, our problem is defined uh, on RD and distance is measured with respect to some norm. For example, Euclidean norm or some other norm. So R is, R is part of the pre processing? <coughs> yes, yes, yes. R is part of the pre processing. You can define problem a little bit differently, just asking for like closest point. Uh, but these problems can be seen to be equivalent, more or less, ish, up to some minor fine grain. Um, but yeah, usually it's convenient to consider R to be part of the preprocessing. Uh, and basically, what do we know about this problem? Not much. So we can either compute the answer naively, or uh, essentially like preprocess all possible queries. Uh, but for example, if you live in, in the norm space, that usually means that your space will be exponential in the dimension D. Uh, and actually, like nothing else uh, is known, and moreover, nothing else uh, can possibly exist if you believe in things like uh, strong exponential time hypothesis. So, for example, as Ryan Williams shown, uh, if you if strong ex exponential hypothesis if, if strong exponential time hypothesis is true, then either you must have linear query time, or your preprocessing must take time which is exponential in the dimension. It's like not very hard to see. Um, so basically, uh, to resolve this, uh, theory and practice have two different answers. And the theory says that, okay, uh, let's instead of requiring like exact answer, let's uh, allow some approximation. Um, so basically, we are guaranteed that there is one point within distance r, but we are okay with any point within distance c times r, where c is some parameter which is larger than one. So I think c being two. Uh, <laughs> And then uh, we can get rid of this curse of dimensionality and we can get data structures which, are, which have space polynomial in n and d and uh, uh, query time which is sublinear in n and polynomial in d. So that's answer of theory. So in practice, the picture is a little bit different. So in practice, we usually want like exact nearest neighbors, but uh, in practice, we do not have usually the worst case instances. So the instances we have in practice, for, for example, this is like distribution of distances of word embedding. Uh, in practice, you have your nearest neighbor, which is at some distance, but then most of the points are non trivially further than this nearest neighbor. So as a result, uh, recovering this point becomes feasible. Uh, and in fact, pretty much the same algorithms that work in D, they work in practice. Uh, because effectively, we need to solve like approximate version of our problem where approximation is this gap, more or less. And one can go even further and argue that if your instance is not like this, then probably you should not be solving nearest neighbors. So nearest neighbors only make sense when actually like there is some at least a little bit of gap between nearest neighbor and everything else. So basically this curse of dimensionality happens only for like uninteresting instances. Um, and okay, so what's the main tool to solve problems like this? Uh, so in low dimensions, the tool that we all know and love is Borodoy diagram that looks like this. It's basically a partition of a space uh, according to who is your nearest neighbor. Uh, and that gives like excellent results, uh, for example, in two or three dimensions maybe. Uh, but in D dimensions, combinatorial, just combinatorial complexity of more on a diagram behaves like M to D. So it doesn't really scale that well. Um, and in high dimensions, instead of like computing more on diagrams, people compute something that can be seen as crude counterpart of Florida diagram that is nevertheless much more efficient algorithmically. Uh, so again, there are many definitions like this, and in this talk I'll show you one specific definition, but basically what we require from these partitions is that they at the same time respect small distances. So basically if your points are close, then uh, they end up in the same part, and they respect large distances. So basically if your points are far, then they will be split with non-zero probability. 
Uh, and also pieces should be simple. So basically, it should be algorithmically simple partition. For example, this partition into random balls that qualify as such. And there are many definitions which show up in approximation algorithms, uh, fuzzed decompositions, and whatnot. Uh, and the uh, appropriate version of this definition is very useful for nearest neighbor search. In fact, we will see uh, some construction that is uh, related to uh, relevant definitions from approximation algorithms in the second part of the talk. But intuitively, you should be looking for something like this kind of like crude partitions that nevertheless work somewhat at least. Um, okay, so basically today my talk will be focusing on uh, how to find such partitions for a given data set. So if you have a data set, what's a proper way to set up optimization problem that kind of find best possible partition like this? And uh, to be slightly more precise, let me give you one additional motivation, uh, which is basically distributed nearest neighbor search. Uh, so suppose you have a points, and suppose you want to process them on a few machines um, to speed up uh, your query time, for example, or uh, just if you don't have enough space, just to store them on different machines. But how, like, the question is how to distribute points across the machines. So naturally, you would like to partition your points into a number of parts, which is number of machines. I think like 10 machines we want to partition into 10 parts. Uh, and when we have a query, the natural thing to do is to try to predict in which parts of your partition it's likely that you will observe nearest neighbor, right? And so then query these machines, and then for each machine use some local nearest neighbor search algorithm. It can be partition based, it can be just like linear scan, it can be anything. So this is additional motivation to look at the partitions into maybe even like not so many parts. Uh, so slightly more formally, what are we looking at? Uh, we have endpoint data set uh, in RD, and we would like to find the possibly random partition, but uh, today we'll be more focusing on deterministic partitions. And you want to partition your endpoints into M parts such that each part contains roughly the same number of points because you want each machine to store roughly the same amount of stuff. And for a typical query point, most of its nearest neighbors should be in the same part. And partition should also be algorithmically simple. So algorithmically simple could be like induced by hyperplanes or by balls or by something that you can easily test. So is this problem clear that we're trying to solve? It's not uh, super precise, but I hope intuition should be clear that that's what we're trying to accomplish. Yeah. Important to be a partition? Uh, well, it doesn't have to be a partition, so you can technically imagine assigning one point to several machines, but uh, let's look at partitions because it's like the cleanest setting. But in general, of course, not necessarily. Um, Actually, the machine is kind of hard for failure in the version of the system. I see, okay. What's the relevant code? Uh, okay, and uh, what was the prior work? There was actually lots of prior work, and uh, some of this prior work has uh, very strong theoretical guarantees, for example, something based on locality sensitive caching or data dependent locality sensitive caching, that's specifically what I talked here like three years ago. Uh, so basically, these results, uh, you can actually prove things about them, uh, and the bounds are pretty nice, but on the negative side, they kind of depend on the data, like, so okay, in case of locality sensitive caching, this just doesn't depend on the data set. This is some distribution over random partitions that you just sample and then show that it works. So for data dependent LSH, we depend on the data set. We like, look at our data set and inspect it a little bit and improve using that. But still, dependence on the data set is very weak. So we do not, it doesn't feel like we're exploiting like full uh, extent of data dependent aspect of the problem. Um, on the other hand, there is a very simple approach that actually works pretty well. Let's just like compute k-means clustering of our data set and split uh, data to the machines according to what cluster uh, your point belongs to. Um, so downside of it is that, uh, first of all, uh, clustering a priori should not be balanced. And as a result, you do not import this balance con con constraint easily. So there are some ways to remedy it, but uh, um, it's problematic, let's just say that. And also another thing is that uh, uh, this feels like we're optimizing the wrong objective function. So what does k means do? k means do it tries to optimize like sum of squares or distances to the cluster centers, right? But like it's not necessarily what we want here. So here we want 
so basically, when we will be discussing later our algorithm, I will try to point out the difference uh, between what we do and what he means do. But it's like pretty clear that like average square error is not what we care about here. And there are also many other heuristics. For example, there is something called random projection tree, which is basically like center your data set and then just cut it in the random direction, split into two halves, and then return. There is also something that is PCA tree, which is variant of RP tree, except that uh, instead of cutting in random direction, you compute top eigenvector of your data and just split in the middle of it. <coughs> uh, it has some theoretical motivation. Uh, so and basically both RP3 and PCA trees, they work pretty well. Uh, so the question is like, <laughs> can you somehow um, systematize this work and in some sense like try to find the best partitions in some principled way? Um, so in particular, can we directly optimize the random objective? <laughs> and if you think about it, it's not so easy. So imagine the simplest possible setting of our problem. So suppose that we have a bunch of points in which I want to split them into two parts. And using a hyperplane. So to make partition absolutely simple as possible. So now your question becomes the following. Uh, split my points into two parts using a hyperplane in a way that if my query, for example, arrives here, most likely its nearest neighbor would be on the same side. And if you think about this problem like for first principles, like I personally spent on this problem and maybe a few years before I realized how to solve it properly, but it's not so easy because like this balance, balance was constrained and the fact that our problem is in some sense like unsupervised. Uh, so it's not a priori clear what method to use. Okay. Um, so I promised you that there are some connections with some recent theory work that we've done. And let me explain now these connections. Uh, basically, these are the two papers we had a year ago uh, with Alex Antonia, Safna, or Sasha Nikolov, and Dave Weingarten. And they really very came here and gave talk about precisely this work. But let me nevertheless repeat uh, the main uh, punchline from this work and uh, explain how our work is connected to this. Um, basically, one sentence summary is that uh, the right way to construct partitions of RD is to look at the graphs embedded in RD and then consider sparse cuts of these graphs. And then these sparse cuts give you some um, partition of RD. Um, so this is very vague. Um, but let me give you the central definitions. Yeah, oh, I, I, I just get, I, I missed that. Say it again. It seems like pretty fast. Yeah. Okay. So great. So so uh, basically, uh, so in these papers, we, we take some space. It could be our deep, it could be metric space, uh, and we essentially discretize it and build a big graph in this, and then uh, in this graph we find the sparse <coughs> cuts. And these sparse cuts uh, then we leave to the geometric space, and then they turn out to be good space partitions of RD. So there's a distribution or something? Uh, yes, on. so uh, basically, OK. So we uh, we want to find a random partition. So by duality, it means that we need to solve to find the deterministic partition of a, of a distribution. So we have a distribution. Uh -huh. um, in fact, like we have distribution over like paired of closed points. So this gives a graph, effectively. Here at the close points? Yeah. Yeah, of like points at distance at most one, for example. So you have, uh, so you have a graph, uh, and you have like distribution of vertices and distribution of edges, and all edges correspond to like close points in your space. And then we show that in such graphs, you can find uh, very sparse cuts. And very sparse cuts uh, mean that we like cross very few edges, and this is a desirable property, and this leads to good space partitions of our space. So maybe let me show you the next slide. Maybe it will be slightly more clear. Um, and it's a very uh, condensed, uh, condensed summary. So you, like, maybe you can watch Eric's talk or talk to me after, after the talk. But basically, the standard definition is the following. So we have a metric space, and we, de we define some quantity, which we call cutting modulus, which is called psi of m epsilon. And uh, the definition is the following. For any graph embedded in our metric space, uh, where we know that edges have length at mod k, so suppose we know that all edges are short, then we must be able to guarantee one of the two things. Either there is a ball of radius k times this parameter psi that contains constant fraction of the vertices, or the graph has an epsilon sparse cut, so cut with conductance at most epsilon. So basically, 
either we have a dense cluster or we have a sparse curve for any drug in our space. And so basically, uh, intuitively, if this parameter is small, then we can produce very good state partitions of our space. Uh, and again, a very <coughs> condensed uh, summary of these two papers. If uh, cutting modulus is small, then we have good uh, data dependent on SH partitions. Also, this parameter happens to be small for a large class of metric spaces. In particular, it, actually, it's like very easy to see that it is a small. It is small for Euclidean spaces. For Euclidean spaces, it is small because uh, Euclidean space <laughs> you can't embed expander into it. Well, uh, so any graph that you can represent in Euclidean space uh, that points are sufficiently far from each other, it must have a sparse cut. It <coughs> follows from some like simple bounds or some ideal values. <laughs> And moreover, uh, in many settings, we can show that these sparse cuts, not only they exist, but they also, without loss of generality, they can be taken to be induced by some nice subsets of our metric space, for example, hyperplanes, <coughs> or something related. Um, okay, if, if it was confusing, this is not uh, not a problem. I just wanted to show uh, a little bit a little bit of connection with this previous work. So the point is. Uh, we can reason that in many spaces, uh, if you have a sufficiently nicely represented graph on them, uh, these graphs have sparse cuts. So we can try to find them and exploit them. Um, so the question is, can we use this structural results in practice? And uh, again, let's remember what our problem is and try to solve it using these insights. So the problem is, we have endpoint data set, we want to partition it into roughly equal pieces, uh, such that for a typical query point, most of its nearest neighbors are in the same part. And partition is algorithmically simple. Um, and we will focus on deterministic partitions, and uh, when we will be doing it, we will have in mind the usual machine learning assumption that queries and data points come from similar distributions, so either from the same distribution or from like, not too different ones. Uh, so let's try to do something about it, and let's suppose first that the query is not arbitrary, but it is uniformly a random data point. So if you have a uniformly random data point, so this is your data set, and suppose that query is also like, say, my query is this. Can I find like three nearest neighbors, right? And so then if you think about it for like one minute, then uh, it's obvious that what we need to solve here is balanced partitioning of the KNN graph. So we basically connect each point to K nearest point, and then we would like to partition it into several parts, like let's say two in this case, in a way that we cut as few edges as possible, and uh, the resulting parts are fairly balanced. If we want more than two parts, then it's just balanced multi-partition. And so uh, this problem is uh, very classical, and there are many uh, good uh, algorithms and heuristics for it. Um, in terms of algorithms with global guarantees, we can also use like spectral partitioning if we wanted to, if for partitioning into two parts. For partitioning into many parts, we can look at more eigenvalues. In practice, there are also like excellent uh, local search based heuristics that work super well. But the point is, we are not still fully done. And why we are not done? First of all, we do not support queries that are not data points. So for example, if query is here, we don't know how to classify it, right? So we need to extend our partition to the whole RD. And partition might not be algorithmically simple. So a priori, whatever you find in this graph can be pretty crazy. So how do we solve this? Uh, we use supervised learning. So the idea is we extend our partition to the whole RD uh, using supervised learning in the following way. We basically train a classifier to predict uh, which part um, like our query belongs, and use graph partition as like training set with labels. Uh, so, for example, in this case, we can find linear separator like this. Uh, in general, it doesn't have to be perfect; it can misclassify some points. But as soon as it classifies essentially all the points correctly, we are fine. So we get we, ex we get extension of the partition to the whole RD. And uh, we actually can get pretty fine grain trade-off between quality and complexity. So uh, we can consider different learning algorithms. For example, we can learn linear model, and then we will get the uh, partition using a hyperplane. We can consider like small neural network, and then it would be like richer class of partitions, but algorithmically slightly more complicated. And you can like play with it and try many different things. Uh, and after we train such a classifier, this classifier itself becomes our partition. So basically. To partition a point, we just run it through the classifier, and whatever classifier outputs, that's our part. Uh, 
Uh, let me give you a few details. So for graph partitioning, we use local search-based heuristics, uh, namely the specific one we use is called Kaki. Uh, so spectral partitioning, uh, I personally love that algorithm. This is really great. It's like very nice to reason about. Unfortunately, in practice, uh, and it works really fast, it scales super well to large graph. Unfortunately, like partitions that it finds can usually easily be improved quite a bit. So basically, instead of spectral partitioning, we use local search-based algorithm. Uh, for learning, we use linear models and small neural networks. So linear models give hyperplane separations, which are the easiest, and they already have pretty decent quality. And neural networks, uh, it's a richer class of uh, partitions, and uh, especially when you partition into many parts, they tend to work much better than linear models. And we use very small neural networks. We do not use like, deep neural networks or anything like this. We use two or three fully connected layers, and the number of nodes in this layers up to like 512, so it's really like small neural network. And at the same time, it must be small because we want our point to be classified super quickly because we're gonna use this partition uh, in the future as data structure. And there is one subtle point that I'm complete, completely uh, hiding under the rug, is that instead of predicting one part, uh, it's usually a good idea to predict the whole ranking of parts. So instead of saying that like one part is the best, maybe we should say that, you know, these top five parts are the best. Uh, in the distributed nearest neighbor setting, that would correspond to that we query not one machine, but like several machines, which is perfectly acceptable. And uh, to train a good predictor of a ranking, it becomes like a little bit more subtle because it uh, starts making sense instead of having one label for graph partitioning, we probably should have some kind of soft label or distribution uh, as a label. And there is a little bit of um, problems with it, but it can be done that way. Assuming that the distribution of queries and data points is similar, you should not be training that, right? Uh, that is true. Like, if your training set sufficiently representative, of course. I mean, yeah, sure. You can't guarantee anything in general, right? But uh, uh, the same, the same, the same, uh, the same question that applies, like why machine learning works, like so, in the same sense of this works, right? So if you if you have like sufficiently big data set and uh, you have the similarity of distributions, it's reasonable to expect it to work. Do you know how many points you need to train No, actually getting any good guarantees here would be very nice, like even for linear models or, or anything like this. Uh, I, no, we don't know. We couldn't think of a good uh, theorem to prove here uh, that would be not like entirely bogus or trivial. So if you have any ideas, it would be nice to discuss it, yeah? I mean, where is it? So you first said the problem was find a near out a nearest neighbor. And now, and of course, the use that for that is for classifying, right? Is is it is this you know is this a biopsy malignant or benign, right? And it seems like what you're doing is you're doing the whole classification of malignant but benign, and then you're using that for finding a nearest neighbor. And then by that time, who cares anymore? Oh. You've decided whether this you know you have a malignant or benign. Uh, so it's a, well, it's a it's a valid question. Uh, so basically, what you're asking, if I understand correctly, if we want to use nearest neighbor for classification, uh, and uh, we'll yeah, we we'll 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 nearest neighbor here. And, uh, okay, this is a this is a great question, but the thing is, the way I'm thinking about nearest neighbor is that uh, where would it use it then? After yeah, you yeah. So that, it, it, it's for like retrieval. So forget it. Like K not classifiers, I don't think uh, this is like. Uh, very prominent application these days anyways, even though my second part of the talk will be about one application where key nearest neighbor classifiers show up big time. It's just in terms of retrieval. Think about like image search, right? I want I just want to find images. I don't care about classifying them. I just have my picture of my cat and I want to find ten similar pictures of cats, right? So then like just classifying that this cat is a cat, it will not give me like ten more pictures of cats. So then nearest neighbors will give you those. So Yes, uh, if you want to use nearest neighbors for classification, this, this creates some kind of like vicious circle, right? But uh, there are other applications where it's not the case. That's the way I think about it. Yeah. Pictures of cats probably under any metric are very far apart, right? Uh, than, no, you know, no, 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 actually no. So if you train, uh, so the, the, no, no, the no, way- There are networks you can train, yeah, yeah. then you get a metric for which it, but somehow it has nothing to do with the Euclidean metric when you get uh, no. So you like after you pass a uh, picture of cats through neural networks, actually then you usually use Euclidean distance uh, on the last layer, 
precisely to measure similarity, and that works like super well. So it's Euclidean, just after passing to oh, your no, knowledge. that's what I'm saying. But then the original nearest neighbor is not very really relevant. No, no, it doesn't matter. It's, it's, just, it's, just, it's just my original points are not cats, but they are uh, images of cats after neural network is all. So you first like take your picture, pass it through neural network, and then you query the data structure. And that, that's how image search works and like being I just got yeah. to know this stuff. Yeah, but it's down to then like a few hundred attributes or something, to cats, dogs, elephants, giraffes or something, right? So now you're down to a space on some small number of things. So usually, usually dimensions of this uh, last layer is like several hundred. So it's again like fairly high dimensional region. So uh, it, it's exactly this region. Okay. Right. Yeah. What is the question? So the question is, we will be on by PF neighbor or to be on based on banking algorithm? The public dimension is there, should there have been all by the sure. banking algorithm? Sure. The question is, why do you have to go to the nearest neighbor technology as opposed to say, uh, yeah. I mean, we don't have to. There are many approaches. It's just this approach works. Uh, it's the it's being used, uh, and uh, I, I, I don't know what to say. So, uh, like, uh, there are alternative approaches, like standard kind of branching, you know, like also scaled up, like RNG and all the team. Okay, uh, I'll take a word for it. I, I don't know much about it. Um, another another application where this shows up a lot is like recommender systems, where you want to like if you similar items or similar users. They usually there is some kind of like transformation that uh, embeds you in some latent space, and there it's also like nearest neighbor retrieval. Uh, again, I'm sure there are like many different approaches, but I do know for a fact that there's like several actual applications nearest neighbor based retrievals are uh, heavily used in there, like practical, and they give great results. Um, okay, um, actually, like relatively recently, Bing released uh, some library to do uh, very good nearest neighbor search precisely for image. Or like Spotify uses nearest neighbor search to find similar songs or similar users. Is this more efficient than the first time? Spotify faster than the first time? I mean, they're fast enough, so it works for them. And quality wise, it's good. Again, like, uh, uh, I don't know uh, what was the spectrum of approaches that they compared to, but I just know for a fact that this is the setting that some people at least really care about. Um, and actually, uh, this uh, distributed setting uh, also is inspired by some real applications. But okay, so uh, so let me compare uh, this algorithm that we developed with this <coughs> previous theoretical work. So basically, uh, in previous work we addressed general metric spaces, and in this work we actually uh, realized that this uh, sparse cuts uh, embedded in the space they are also pretty productive even for the Euclidean space, even though Euclidean space is much simpler. And the whole point of previous work was to be general and to handle general metric spaces. Um, so now, what's our graph? So in the theoretical work, the graph was the whole space being discretized. And in particular, like for example, if we discretize RD, the graph was of exponential size. And that was uh, some difficulty we had to deal with before. But here, we are more pragmatic, and instead of partitioning the whole space, we just partition K and then graph supported on our point. It's a much simpler problem and much more practical. Uh, in the theoretical work, we use spectral partitioning because it's, the easy, it's pretty easy to reason about. We just need to bound the eigenvalues of our graph, and then we get by figuring it all into immediately existence of a good spectral partition. Uh, and we were partitioning only in two parts. And so now we use instead combinatorial algorithm um, that partitions the graph in many parts. But as a downside, it's hard to reason about it. We do not have any provable guarantees or anything like this. And uh, okay, so now uh, when it comes to extending partition to the whole space, before we didn't need to do anything because we were partitioning the whole space. So that was um, like step that we didn't need. And now we use this supervised learning essentially in a black box way to extend the partition to our deal. And uh, how we were getting nice cuts uh, instead of just some graph cuts. Before that, we had to work hard and cool it separately that like partitions of our graph without loss of generality can be used by some nice cuts of RD. And now it is enforced by a choice of a model. Like if you want partition at the hyperplane, just train a linear classifier. If you want some, I don't know, like uh, level sets of some polynomials, train some like polynomial kernel or whatever. Um, so basically, uh, you can control the class of partitions by the class of models. That um, so let me show a couple of experiments. Uh, we can see there are a few data sets everywhere, distances say median. One data set is like word embeddings, another data set is image descriptors. And uh, we want to repeat the nearest neighbor. And the trade-offs are between number of points that we repeat 
and accuracy. So how, like basically what the fraction of plays for which uh, we get uh, the good fraction of the ten points is this correct. And uh, basically we observed in our experiments we tried many different things, but we observed that as a baseline k means was the strongest from prior work. So this k means is kind of like naive approach. Just can use compute k means of your data set and use it as a partition. Uh, but uh, basically in this setup when we have few parts and we insist on deterministic partition, uh, <coughs> on a single partition, most important thing, uh, this is the best of all the alternatives. Uh, and we also compare uh, partitions that we obtain using linear uh, learning, uh, we compare it with like other methods such as random projections, PCA trees, and uh, two means. Two means is basically when k is equal to two, then your two means partition is just a type of uh, And there is a point, it's not super important for this code, but the point is you can either, if you want to partition into, for example, 256 parts, you can either compute a one shot partition into 256 parts, or you can compute partition into 16 parts, and then recursively split each part into 16 parts. Sometimes it's more preferable. And so these are the results. So uh, uh, basically, we compare our algorithm, which we call neural LSH, uh, with k means, and uh, we observe that uh, our algorithm is consistently better for both data sets, especially it's better if you care. Uh, so basically, for each query, you receive some number of points, right? Uh, then you can either average this number of points over query, so you can consider some quantile, 95th percentile, or something like this. So, Average corresponds to throughput of your data structure, and 95th percentile roughly corresponds to latency of your data structure. So especially the gap is big if you consider uh, 95th percentile. Uh, and the reason for this is because we enforce a balancedness pretty easily. Uh, our parts are balanced, and so average and 95th percentile are pretty much the same. But for k-means, the gap is pretty big. Um, so for 95th percentile, basically our improvement is even more noticeable. For example, for SIFT, we essentially do not improve in averages, but we do improve in 95th percentile. Wait, a naive question, what is the y-axis? Oh, y-axis is uh, accuracy. So it basically, I give some number of candidates, what the fraction of them are among my 10 nearest neighbors. And then I average those over to yeah? What is the x-axis? Oh, x-axis is how many points I agree. So, for example, if you have a partition, uh, you get a query, and uh, it gives you some ranking over parts. And then I say, I take like first maybe two parts, or first three parts, and that gives you. So that's why it's like discrete graph. It's like, it's jumps correspond to one more part, kind of. So, India, yeah. you also said that k means was bad because the partitions were not balanced. Uh, yeah. Was, is there, did you see that in the experiments? Of course, yeah, of course. Uh, in, in fact, like, there are heuristics how to make it more balanced, but then, like, it degrades the quality of the partitions. So it's actually like, how to, like, Actually, like, uh, regardless of this work, just the independent question how to get good k-means like heuristic that produces balanced partitions, actually I would like to see that because it would be useful for many things. I do not have a like, very satisfactory answer to this. So oh. what's the data again? Uh, what, what are these two data sets? Oh, so this, this is word embeddings. Uh, um, basically, it's, um, uh, we, we take a big corpus of text and then we train, for each word, we train like 100 dimensional vector such that like semantic similarity between words corresponds to like Euclidean distance between vectors. And this is image descriptors. Um, actually, these image descriptors are not induced by neural networks. They induced by they're basically some like handcrafted features. Uh, but like similar results qualitatively hold for uh, image descriptors obtained through neural networks. So both of these data sets are, I think, 100, maybe this is 100 dimensions, this is 128 dimensions, and both of them are outside like one million roughly. Um, and uh, basically, this is uh, so. This was like single partition into sixteen parts, and this is multi-partition uh, when we have two levels and two hundred fifty-six parts in total. And again, qualitatively, uh, results are similar. Oh, training set size is the whole data set, so one million. Uh, yeah, uh, and then we evaluate it on just bunch of queries. Actually, it's a good experiment related to your question. What if we train it on like a tiny uh, subset of it? Would it degrade a lot? And like, well, I, I also imagine, but then like if you start varying this, would you see a jump or would it be just like, I, yeah, it's, a, it's an interesting kind of experiment. You could have done it. Uh, uh, and let me, okay, uh, 
That was it for uh, ah, ah, ah and okay. So one last experiment I want to show you is basically um, a relation between our algorithm, uh, which is now uses linear models. It doesn't use neural networks anymore. Uh, so now it produces very simple partition. Uh, and then, like, what I want to show here is that even in this case, it actually produces very good results. So compared to alternative approaches. So alternative approaches are two means. PCA tree where we cut across top eigen value, <coughs> top eigen length, and uh, random projection. Uh, and basically, uh, again, like now, um, basically the experiment here is the following. We uh, partition our data set into two parts, then each part into two parts, then each part into two parts, up to like 10 levels. So 10 levels would be 1024 parts. And then for each of the number of levels, which is typically accuracy of basically nearest neighbor. Uh, and it gives you like 10, 10 points on this curve. And we can, for each of these algorithms, we can also do this recursive partitioning up to 10 levels, and it also gives like 10 points. And uh, as we see, like basically for our algorithm, this curve is about all the other curve. Uh, and again, for seed, interesting thing is that again, two means, it on average does as well as our algorithm, but uh, 95th percentile is worse, and basically all the other algorithms average is also worse. Um, maybe this is a naive question about, about how you do these kinds of experiments, but how do you measure the quality of it? Oh, just very simple. It's like very pretty precise graphic. Let me explain it again. Um, so first of all, okay, so first of all, we need set of queries. So in seed, seed comes already with a bunch of queries. That's just like nature of this data set. So for this data set, we take out uh, like few points, call them queries, and just remove them from training set. So kind of split into like query set and training set. Uh, then we train on the training set, and then for each query we just run it uh, through the algorithm. It gives us uh, some like number of candidate points, and then we just uh, compute for these candidate points how many of them are among ten nearest neighbors. So, for example, if out of ten nearest neighbors I happen to capture like eight of them, then my accuracy is like 0.8, right? And then I average this over all the queries. Okay, so related line of work, uh, this is learn to hash. Uh, there is lots of literature how to uh, use learning for sketching points. Instead of partitioning, uh, the point of this work is we produce some binary codes, maybe 64 bits or 128 bits, such that Euclidean distance of your points has to do with, say, having distance between these codes. Uh, in particular, there, there is a very nice work, uh, very recent, uh, it's like this year, I clear, which is called Neural Catalyzer. So they kind of train a neural network to, to com compute the transformation of your points in a way that, that it becomes um, like the points after passing through this neural network, they become more amenable to nice uh, binary codes as they describe. And in fact, we were pretty excited about this work and we tried it actually to get good partitions. So it was natural to try to use this neural network and then use some k-means or other algorithm or something. But we actually found that uh, this uh, neural network that you train using this algorithm it actually makes data set harder to partition. Weirdly enough, at the same time, it makes it easier to sketch. So I don't, I can't say I fully understand this phenomenon, and it would be nice also to quantify it somehow. somehow right? So basically, take neural network from this work, pass points through it, and compute k means, and just evaluate it as a partition. So you're only going to cross that by the output. Yeah. 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 So you're we take it with this how the metric is not suitable for your side. It's not suitable. It makes it makes partitions worse, not better. Yeah. Even though it makes some mm. other algorithms for like nearest neighbor retrieval better. Um, but you don't understand why. Uh, I do not understand why, but uh, it seems to be a consistent phenomenon. So some other people also check it. So it seems not to be a bug. So of course we can never be sure. Uh, okay. Uh, so what the summary of this part of the talk, uh, so basically showed new algorithm for genetic partitioning. It was inspired by some theoretical work of done uh, recently. And uh, basically the two steps very roughly are, we first build KNN graph of our data set, then we partition this graph uh, using some blunt graph partitioner, and then we use supervised learning to extend this partition to the whole RD, uh, either using linear models or neural networks or pretty much any class of models that you like. Uh, and it's potentially useful for distributed nearest neighbor search. The problem with using it uh, is that 
it's not very easy to scale up. So I've shown you experiments for million data points. Maybe you can run it for 10 million data points if you go out of your way. But then, if you run it for like really large data, for like billion points or more, the problem becomes that graph partitioning becomes like pretty hard. So maybe that's where we need to start using like spectral methods or some other related methods. Uh, we haven't really explored it that well. It's a pretty exciting direction for future work. And of course, uh, the, it, it, as I said, it has like strong connections with recent theoretical work. But um, of course, the main question here, can we get any kind of proof of guarantees, even not in the worst case, but under some model of data or something like this. And as I said, another great open problem is scale up to large data sets. And another thing I'm pretty interested in here, can we train graph partition and classifier jointly? So right now it's like two-stage process. We first train graph partition, uh, and then we train uh, classifier. But it seems to be like a pretty wrong way of doing it because it's much more reasonable to try to train them jointly, except that I don't know how to do it well. So far, this is unsupervised. Are you talking about supervised now, or uh, so, so, so it's still unsupervised, right? So, but uh, uh, right now, right now, I'm like between <coughs> unsupervised to supervised by doing this graph, part uh, graph partition. But maybe right now I need to. I don't know. One, one naive way of doing it, for example, I can imagine is uh, yeah. take a graph partition, then train a classifier, then take this classifier, take partition that induces on the graph and try to improve it locally and then retrain the classifier or something like this. I, uh, I, I, I don't know how to do it in a like, nice way. But it would still be a supervised problem. Um, and uh, another thing is that it's nature of the frame extend this approach to non-Euclidean metrics uh, because uh, graph partitioning and like KNS graph, this is like universal construction. We use nothing about our metrics. Uh, but then of course learning might be more interesting. So. Uh, for um, for our Euclidean case, we used coordinates and like input features, um, but uh, for this case, this is not clear anymore. Okay, so let me move on to the second part of the talk. I don't have too much time, but I don't I don't think I need that much time actually for this. Uh, I think I can fit in like 12 minutes most of it. So I'm gonna switch gears a little bit and talk about optimal transport, uh, also known as as earth mover distance. So what, what's the setting we are considering here? So the setting is very simple. We have a finite set of points in RD, so which I will call dictionary, and we will see, uh, first of all, why I call it that, and second, we will see what's the specific application of this set up in one slide. And then we have two subsets of the dictionary, which are much smaller than the whole dictionary, they're like relatively fast, uh, two sets of size S. And we would like to compute uh, minimum cost, perfect matching between them, where the cost of the edge is Euclidean distance between the two points. So basically, formally, we are optimizing over flow uh, such that it has right marginals on both sides, uniform marginals on both sides, and we basically minimize this sum. So this is like classical optimal transport problem. It's also called Wasserstein 1. 1 is because we consider like third powers here. If you consider p, p powers here, it would be Wasserstein p, but let's focus on Wasserstein 1. Uh, so what's the motivation? So motivation, uh, so until recently, uh, this was used for uh, similarity between images, but since recently, after, like, after this paper by Kusner et al., it has been a very prominent tool for considering uh, distances between text documents. So how does it work? So suppose that you have two documents uh, that have no common words uh, between them. Um, so basically, what's the natural way to, to do it? So you consider some kind of word embeddings, uh, and uh, you consider each sentence as distribution over respective words. Uh, and uh, basically then what you want to compute is you want to compute minimum matching. So you want to match uh, each word from, from left to each word on the right. And we can have like fractional flow, but don't worry too much about it. So the point is that uh, as this paper demonstrated, uh, and like lots of follow-up works refined on it, basically this is a very good distance between sentences or like text documents. Um, so, okay, so you asked me about KNN classifier uh, in the previous part of the talk, and actually this paper specifically demonstrates that if you want to classify your text document, then KNN classifier with respect to this optimal transport distance works like very well. So this is a specific claim that this paper makes. Um, okay, so that's why if we, if we want to do like the KNN classification, then maybe we should first solve like algorithmically nearest neighbor problem. So this paper actually already points out that 
nearest neighbor search with respect to this distance is not easily tractable, they propose some heuristics uh, to deal with it, which I will mention. Um, but okay, so the punchline here is that computing optimal transport between two distributions is not very easy. Uh, I mean, it can be easily done in polynomial time using minimum cost max maximum flow algorithm. That much we know. But uh, we would like to do something fast, approximate. So what do we know? Uh, first of all, there are like linear time algorithms uh, which give pretty coarse approximation. So for example, one thing that this Kuzmir et al. paper considered was just collapse each distribution into a mean and use distance between means as a proxy for your optimal transport distance. Um, so then for specific uh, work to the application, what you can do, you can just like, okay, Never mind this like granularity of this problem. Let me forget about <laughs> words being close but unequal. Let me just like compute how many common words I intend to assume. That gives you some approximation of of, of this OP distance. Uh, then there is an algorithm which is called quad P, which I will mention in one, uh, in a couple of slides. So this is like classic uh, approximation algorithm for optimal transport that actually had provable guarantees and it was uh, independently obtained in several works, including this one by Indy and Tucker. Um, at the same time, uh, so this was linear time. Uh, and in linear time, let me just say that you can't even have two sets. Your two sets you're taking the distance of always have the same number of points in them? For simplicity, let's say that. If this is not the case, like this doesn't have to be the case, but if it's not the case, we can just say that uh, the set with like more points, it assigns like less weight to each of them. And then you consider like fractional flow. So in linear time, you can't even write down matrix of all pairwise distances. So these algorithms are faster than that. But if you allow quadratic time, in particular, you work explicitly with matrix of distances, then what you can do, you can do like greedy algorithms. This was also from this same paper, Kuzner et al. And then there is this like very nice line of work, which started by Kuturi, and uh, there are maybe now like hundreds of papers that do that. Uh, they basically explore this like synchron uh, iterations to solve optimal transport. And we can run it with like very, very few iterations so that it's fast. Uh, and it already like, can give pretty good quality of the answer. Again, I'm happy to talk offline what exactly this algorithm does. It's kind of nice. It's like based on matrix scaling. <coughs> um, so basically, the point of this work is that we propose a new linear time algorithm. So in particular, it's still faster than just yielding all matrix of pairwise distances. Uh, so in a certain way, it's like slower linear time than these methods. I will explain later what this means. And uh, at the same time, it gives like much better approximation than this like coarse approximation method. It gives approximations that are comparable to this like quadratic time algorithm. And we call it flow tree. It's kind of like small modification to flow tree. Um, and in general, the reason why I even include this uh, part, uh, so I'm, I'm giving a talk at PD seminar. I'm already like coming to the crime of like not showing any proof of guarantees in the first half of the talk. Why I'm adding this here? So the reason why I'm adding this here is that. Uh, there is this like whole uh, exciting line of work of like tree embeddings. So we work with like metric spaces. We want to solve some problem on that. So what do we do? We like take our metric space and embed it into some tree, and then solve problem on the tree. And uh, historically, the first uh, result of this sort was by Bart Powell, and then later it was developed into like many other results. So sharp bounds for like tree approximations was obtained by uh, these two references. Uh, actually, Anupam is even one of them. Anupam Gupta. Um, so the point is, this gives you like bunch of help, like this gives you basically this uh, paradigm of like tree approximation that gave lots of breakthroughs in like approximation and non-line algorithms. But until recently, the way that people thought about it, at least like people who I spoke to, I don't know, maybe someone was thinking otherwise, but I was thinking that and like many people were thinking that, that this is a beautiful tool uh, that will never give anything practical. So you will always lose this like log left and right and uh, nothing good will come out of it. Like in practice, even though in theory, this is super important and beautiful. Uh, so, but recently there has been like bunch of papers uh, where people realized that uh, actually tree embeddings are useful in practice. Like you can actually get like good practical uh, bounds for like many problems and optimal transport is one of them. And then we'll explain what this means in a second. But the point is like if you have some problem on a metric space, then think about using uh, tree embeddings. A specific construction of a tree embedding that works is something called quad tree. So what is a quad tree? Actually, like quad tree is kind of misleading name uh, because it comes from this like low dimensional partition, but it can be used in high dimensions. It is not tied to low dimensions at all. So the point is, you start with your points, 
they give you root node, and then you partition it into like four parts, and four parts would be on the plane. In general, it would be exponentially many parts. Uh, and then you basically continue this recursive, recursive splitting until each point is in its own leaf. And uh, even though uh, RT of this tree can be like two two dimension, but most of these subtrees are empty and we can safely ignore them. We we'll only go to subtrees that are not empty. So as a result, your tree actually has a like, pretty small, pretty small size. Uh, so you can obtain a tree something like this, and then we put weights on it, some like basically weights are proportional to uh, <coughs> Basically, cell size. And um, okay, so basically, what what was plot three algorithm from the previous work uh, for optimal transfer, to which we are proposed a minor modification. So algorithm was let's instead of finding optimal flow in the geometric space, let's find optimal flow on a tree. And in fact, optimal flow on a tree it can be found by greedy algorithm because your weights are exponentially decaying. So it always makes sense to match points as much as possible in the subtree and only then like propagate up, right? Uh, and uh, for costs, we are using this di distance metric. So basically, for example, distance between these two guys is like six, right? One, two, two, one. Whereas in reality, it was like something else. Like, just one thing. Did you say, did you say optimal flow or optical flow? Optimal. Okay. Optimal flow in the field, no optical flow. <laughs> um, yeah, 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 great. Uh, okay, so here is our modification. It's very simple but it improves the results a lot. So the point is, let's do the same. Let's compute optimal flow in the tree, but then instead of using a tree metric as a cost, we are gonna use like a regional Euclidean metric as a cost. So this feels like almost a no-brainer. Why we didn't do it before, right? Why we had to use this like crappy distance metric instead of like true distances. So the point is that actually this algorithm has some other advantages that our modification doesn't have, namely, uh, this itself actually gives embedding of optimal transport distance into L1. So in fact, like this minimization program can be encoded as like at some L1 distance between two specific sparse vectors. It's like not hard to see. But if you give up on uh, using tree metric and you want to resort to original distances, this is not an embedding anymore. So, uh, uh, but nevertheless, it's a linear time algorithm. We can find flow using like greedy algorithm. And it's a single linkage. Uh, like banning tree. Uh, it's 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 not it's not even that it's simple. It's just greedy algorithm, like uh, just just much. Why do you take minimum like spanning tree and do the same thing? So minimum minimum spanning tree requires like quadratic time. You need to compute all distances. Otherwise, you wouldn't be okay. Well, other it's one of the heuristics I said. Greedy kind of does that from uh, from some okay. prior work. Yeah. So this is to speed up. Like yeah, yeah, yeah. Essentially, essentially, the if you if you look at this correctly, it's kind of like. Uh, Single linkage, but in nearest neighbor graph, in the KNN graph, or like small k. So it's 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 essentially a speed up of that, yeah. Um, so okay, so what can we say, say theoretically? So theoretically, nice thing about this algorithm is that it's never it never so this algorithm <coughs> can under